This is Illyria, lady. And what should I do in Illyria? My brother, he is in Elysium. Perchance he is not drowned. What think you say? It is perchance that you yourself were saved. Oh, my poor brother. And so perchance may he be. Oh, true, madam. And to comfort you with chance, assure yourself. After our ship did split when you and those poor numbers saved with you, hung on our driving boat, I saw your brother, most provident in peril, bind himself to a strong mast that lived upon the sea, where, like our Ryan on a dolphin's back, I saw him hold acquaintance with the waves so long as I could see. For saying so, there's gold. Knowest thou this country? Aye, madam, well. For I was bred and born not three hours' travel from this very place. Who governs here? A noble Jew, in nature and in name. What is his name? Orsino. Orsino! I have heard my father name him. He was a bachelor then. But so is now. Or was so very late, for but a month ago I went from hence, and then twas fresh in murmur that he did seek the love of fair Olivia. What's she? A virtuous maid. The daughter of a count that died some twelve months since, then leaving her in the protection of his son, her brother, who shortly also died, for whose dear love they say she hath abjured the company and sight of men. Oh, that I serve that lady, and might not be delivered to the world till I had made mine own occasion mellow what my estate is. That were hard to compass, because she will admit no kind of suit, no, not the duke's. There is a fair behaviour in me, Captain. I pray you, and I'll pay you bounteously. Conceal me what I am, and be my aid for such disguise as happily shall become the form of my intent. I'll serve this Duke. Thou shalt present me as a eunuch to him. It may be worth thy pains, for I can sing and speak to him in many sorts of music that will allow me very worth his service. What else may happen to time I will commit? Only shake thou thy silence, my wit. Be you his eunuch, and your mute I'll be. When my tongue blabs, then let my eyes not see. I thank you. Lead me on. If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it, that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. That's strain again. It had a dying fall. Oh, it came o'er my ear like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odour. Enough, no more. Tis not so sweet now as it was before. O oh, spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou, that notwithstanding thy capacity receiveth as the sea, naught enters there of what validity and pitch so air but falls into a basement and low price, even in a minute. So full of shapes is fancy that it alone is high fantastical. Oh, when mine eyes did see Olivia first, methought she purged the air of pestilence. That instant was I turned into a heart, and my desires, like fell and cruel hounds, ere since pursue me. How now? What news from her? So please, my lord, I might not be admitted, but from her hand they do return this answer. The element itself, till seven years' heat, shall not behold her face at ample view. But like a cloister she will veil it walk, and water once a day her chamber round with eye offending brine. All this to season a brother's dead love, which she would keep fresh and lasting in her sad remembrance. Oh, she that hath the heart of that fine frame to pay this debt of love, but to a brother. How will she love when the rich golden shaft hath killed the flock of all affections else that live in her? When liver, brain, and heart, these sovereign thrones are all supplied and filled, oh, sweet perfections with one self-king. 
Away before me to sweet beds of flowers. Love vaults lie rich when canopied with bowers. <sighs> what a plague means my niece to take the dead of her brother thus. I'm sure care's an enemy to life. Oh, my troll, Sir Toby, you must come in earlier nights. Your cousin, my lady, takes great exception to your ill hours. Uh, let her accept before accepted. Aye, but you must confine yourself within the modest limits of order. Confine? I'll confine myself, no finer than I am. <laughs> these clothes are good enough to drink in, and so are these boots too. And they be not let them hang themselves in their own straps. That coughing and drinking will undo you. I heard my lady talk of it yesterday. A little foolish knight that you brought in one night here to be her wooer. Who? Sir Andrew Aguti? Aye, he. Oh, he's as tall a man as any in Illyria. What's that to the purpose? Why, he had three thousand ducats a year. Aye, but he'll have but a year in all these ducats. He's a very fool and a prodigal. Oh, fie on you that you'll say so. Why? He plays on the vile of the gamboys and speaks three or four languages word for word without book and has all the good gifts of nature. He hath indeed. <laughs> Almost natural. For besides that he's a fool, he's a great quarreller. And book that he hath the gift of a coward to allay the ghost he hath in quarrelling. Tis thought among the prudent he would quickly have the gift of a grave. By this hand they are scoundrels and substractors that say so of him. Who are they? They that add moreover. He's drunk. Nightly in your company. We've drinking health to my niece. <laughs> I'll drink to her as long as there is passage in my throat and drink in Illyria. <laughs> what wench? Castiliano Volgo, for here comes Sir Andrew Aguface. Sir Toby Belch! How now, Sir Toby Belch! Sweet Sir Andrew! <laughs> Boom! You fair shrew. You too, sir. A cost, Sir Andrew, a cost. <laughs> What's that? My niece's chambermaid. Good mistress, a cost. I desire better acquaintance. <gasps> My name is Mary, sir. Oh, good mistress, Mary, a cost. <laughs> you mistake, knight. Uh, a cost is franta. Border. Woo ha! Sail ha! By my troth, I would not undertake her in this company. Is that the meaning of a cause? Very well, gentlemen. And thou let part so, Sir Andrew, would thou mightst never draw a sword again. And you part so, mistress, I would I might never draw a sword again. Fair lady, do you think you have fools in hand? Sir, I have not you by the hand. Oh, nothing but you shall have, and here's my hand. Now, sir, dart is free, I pray you. Bring your hand to the buttery bar and let it drink. Wherefore, sweetheart, what's your metaphor? It's dry, sir. Oh, why, I think so. I am not such an ass, but I can keep my hand dry. And what's your jest? The dry jest, sir. Are you full of them? Aye, sir. I have them at my finger's end. Marry, now I let go your hand. I am bound. <laughs> oh, knight, thou lapsed a cup of canary. <laughs> When did I see thee so good gown? Never in your life, I think, and unless you see Canary put me down. Sometimes he thinks I have no more wit than a Christian or an ordinary man has. But I'm a great eater of beef, and I believe that does harm to my wit. Oh, no question. And I thought that I'd forswear it. I'll ride home tomorrow, Sir Toby. Poor Quire, my dear knight. What is poor Quire? Do or not do? Oh, I would I bestow that time in the tongues that I have in fencing, dancing, and bear baiting. Oh, had I but followed the arts! Then hadst thou had an excellent head of hair. Why? Would that have mended my hair? Your oh, first question, for thou seest it will not curl by nature. Oh, but it becomes me rather enough, does oh, not. Excellent! It hangs like flax from a distaff, and I hope to see a good housewife take thee between the legs and spin it off! <laughs> well, faith, I'll hope tomorrow, Sir Toby, your niece will not be seen. Or if she be, it's four to one, she'll none of me. The Count himself here hard by moves her. Show none of the Count. She'll not match above her degree, neither in estate, years, nor wit. I've had her sweat. 
Touch this life in it, man! Don't stay a month longer! <laughs> I am a fellow of the strangest mind in the world. I delight in masks and revels sometimes altogether. Oh, no good in these gigas shows, isn't it? Yes. Any man in the Leary or whatsoever he be, <laughs> under the degree of my betters, mm -hmm. and yet I will not compare it with an old man. <laughs> what is thy excellence in a galliard night? Ooh, faith, I can cut a cable. Oh, and I can cut the mutton to it. And I think I have the back trick. Simply as strong as any man in the area. Oh, wherefore are these things hid? Wherefore have these gifts a curtain before them? Why dost thou not go to church in a galliard and come home to Granto? Oh, my very walk should be a jig. I should not so much as make water but in a sink of ace. Oh, what dost thou mean? Is it a world to hide virtues in? I did think by the excellent constitution of thy leg that it was formed under the star of a galliard. Ay, it is strong, and does a different world in a flame-coloured star. Uh, shall we set about some rebels? What shall we do else? Were we not born under Taurus? Taurus? That's sides and heart? No, sir! It is legs and sides! <laughs> Come, let me see the caper. Oh, excellent! I am! If the Duke continue these favours towards you, Cesario, you are like to be much advanced. He hath known you but three days, and already you are no stranger. You either fear his humour or my negligence, but you call in question the continuance of his love. Is he inconstant, sir, in his favours? Hmm. No. Believe me, I thank you. Here comes the Count. Who saw Cesario? Oh? Huh? On your attendance, my lord, here. Stand you a while, love. Cesario, thou knowest no less, but all. I have unclassed to thee the book even of my secret soul. Therefore, good youth, address thy gates unto her. Be not denied access. Stand at her doors and tell them that thy fixed footstool grow till thou have audience. Sure, my noble lord. If she be so abandoned to her sorrow as it is spoke, she never will admit me. Oh, be clamorous and leap all civil bounds rather than make unprofited return. Say I do speak with her, my lord. What then? Oh, then unfold the passion of my love. Surprise her with discourse of my dear faith. It shall become thee well to act my woes. She shall attend it better in thy youth than in Anuncio's of more grave aspect. I think not so, my lord. Oh, dear lad, believe it. So they shall yet belie thy happy years that say thou art a man. Diana's lip is not more smooth and rubious. Thy small pipe is as the maiden's organ, shrill and sound, and everything is semblative a woman's part. I know thy constellation is right apt for this affair. Prosper well in this, and thou shalt live as freely as thy lord to call his fortunes thine. I'll do my best to woo your lady. And yet, a baleful strife. Whoever I woo, myself would be his wife. Nay, either tell me where thou hast been, or I will not open my lips so wide as a bristle may enter by way of thy excuse. My lady will hang thee for thy absence. Oh, let her hang thee. He that is well hanged in this world needs to fear no colours. And he will be hanged for being so long absent, or to be turned away. Is not that as good as a hanging to you? Many a good hanging prevents a bad marriage. <laughs> you are resolute then? Not so neither, but I am resolved on two points. That if one break, the other will hold, or if both break, your Gaskins fall. Oh, apt in good faith, very apt. Well, go thy ways. If Sir Toby would leave off drinking, thou wert as witty a piece of Eve's flesh as any in Illyria. Oh, peace, your own. No more of that. Here comes my lady. Make your excuse wisely, you were best. Wit, and be thy will, put me into good fooling. 
those wise men that think they have thee, they oft prove fools, and I that I'm sure I have thee not, may pass for a wise man. But what says Quinapolis? Better a witty fool than a foolish wit. God bless thee, lady. Take the fool away. Do you not hear, fellows? Take away the lady. Go to, you are a dry fool. I'll know more of you. Besides, you grow dishonest. Two faults, Madonna, that drink and good counsel will amend. Forgive the dry fool drink, he is no longer dry. Bid the dishonest man mend himself. If he mend, he is no longer dishonest. If he cannot, then let the botcher mend him. Anything that's mended is but patched. Virtue that transgresses is but patched with sin, and sin that amends is but patched with virtue. If that the simple syllogism will serve so, if not, what remedy? As there is no true cripple but calamity, so beauty's a flower. The lady may take away the fool, therefore I say again, take her away. Sir, I bade them take away you. Miss Prussian lies degree. Good Madonna, give me leave to prove you a fool. Can you do it? Dexterously, good Madonna. Make your proof. I must catechise you for it, Madonna. <laughs> Good wine mouse of virtue, answer me. Well, sir, for want of other idleness, I'll bide your proof. Good Madonna, why mournest thou? Good fool, for my brother's death. I think his soul is in hell, Madonna. I know his soul is in heaven, fool. The more fool, Madonna, to mourn for your brother's soul being in heaven. Take away the fool, gentlemen. What think you of this fool, Malvolio? Doth he not mend? Yes, and shall do till the pangs of death shake him. Infirmity that decays the wise doth ever make the better fool. God send you, sir, a speedy infirmity, the more increasing your folly. Sir Toby will be sworn I am no fox, but he will not pass his word for tuppence that you are no fool. How say you to that, Malvolio? Marvel your ladyship takes delight in such a barren rascal. I saw him put down the other day with an ordinary fool that has no more brain than a stone. Look you, he's out of his guard already. Unless you laugh and minister an occasion to him, he's gagged. I protest I take these wise men that crow so at these set kind of fools no better than the fool's zane. Sick of self love, Malvolio, and taste with a distempered appetite. To be generous, guiltless, and of free disposition is to take those things for bird bolts that you deem cannon bullets. There is no slander in an allowed fool, though he do nothing but rail, nor no railing in a known discreet man, though he do nothing but reprove. Now, Mercury, adieu thee with leasing, for thou speakest well of fools. <laughs> Madam, there is at a gate a young gentleman much desires to speak with you. From the Count Orsino, is it? I know not, madam. Tis a fair young man and well attended. Who of my people hold him in delay? Sir Toby, madam, your kinsman. Fetch him off, I pray you. He speaks nothing but madmen. Fie on him. Go you, Malvolio. If it be a suit from the Count, I am sick or not at home. What you will to dismiss it. Now you see, sir, how your fooling grows old, and people dislike it. Thou hast spoke for us, Madonna, as if thy eldest son should be a fool. Whose skull shall have crammed with brains, there he comes. Hey, One of your kin has a most hey, hey, oh, in the rain. Oh, my honour, <laughs> off drunk. Let us see at the gate, cousin. Uh, a gentleman. A gentleman? Mm. What gentleman? This is a gentleman here. <coughs> oh, plague on these pickled herrings. <laughs> oh, no, such a... <laughs> Toby. Cousin, cousin, how have you come so early by this lechery? Lechery? I defy lechery! <gasps> Psst! There's one at the gate. I marry, what is he? Oh, let him be the devil anywhere I cannot. Give me faith, say I. Well, it's all on. Hello, the wind and the rain. What's a drunken 
man like fool. Like a drowned man, a fool, and a madman. One draught above heat makes him a fool, the second mads him, and the third drowns him. Go you, and seek the coroner, and let him sit on my cuss, for he's in the third degree of truth. He's drowned. He is but a man. Let Madonna look after him, and the fool shall look to the madman. Madam, yon young fellow swears he will speak with you. I told him you were sick. He takes on himself to understand so much, and therefore comes to speak with you. I told him you were asleep. He seems to have a foreknowledge of that too, and therefore comes to speak with you. What's to be said to him, lady? He's fortified against any denial. Well, tell him he shall not speak with me. Has been told so. He says he'll stand at your door like a sheriff's post and be the supporter of a bench, but he'll speak with you. What kind of man is he? Why, of mankind? What manner of man? A very ill manner. He'll speak with you, will you or no? Of what personage and years is he? Not yet old enough for a man, nor young enough for a boy. He is very well favoured and speaks very shrewishly. One would think his mother's milk was scarce out of him. Let him approach. Give me my veil. Come, throw it over my face. We'll once more hear Orsino's embassy. The Honourable Lady of the House, which is she? <laughs> Speak to me. I shall answer for her. Your will? <clears throat> Most radiant, exquisite, and unmatchable beauty. I pray you, tell me if this be the Lady of the House, for I never saw her. I would be loath to cast away my speech, but besides that it is excellently well, well penned, I have taken great pains to con it. <laughs> Whence came you, sir? I can say little more than I have studied, and that question's out of my part. Good gentle one, give me modest assurance, if you be the lady of the house, that I may proceed in my speech. Hmm. Are you a comedian? No, my profound heart. And yet, hmm. by the very fangs of malice, I swear I am not that I play. Are you the lady of the house? If I do not usurp myself, I am. No, sir. If you are she, you do usurp yourself. For what is yours to bestow is not yours to reserve. But this is from my commission. I will on with my speech and your praise, and then show you the heart of my message. Come to what's important in it. I forgive you the praise. Alas, I took great pains to study it. And tis poetical. <laughs> tis the more like to be feigned. I pray you keep it in. I heard you were saucy at my gates and allowed your approach rather to wonder at you than to hear you. Will you hoist sail, sir? There lies your way. No, good swallow. I am to hull here a little longer. Some mollification for your giant, sweet lady. Tell me your mind. I am a messenger. Well, you have some hideous matter to deliver, but the courtesy of it is so fearful. Speak your office. It alone concerns your ear. I bring no overture of war, no taxation of homage. I hold the olive in my hand. My words are as full of peace as matter. Yet you began rudely. What are you? What would you? The rudeness that hath appeared in me have I learned from my <coughs> entertainment. What I am, what I would, are a secret as maidenhead. To your ears, divinity. To any others, profanation. Give us the place alone. We will hear this, divinity. Now, sir, what is your text? Most sweet lady. Oh, a comfortable doctrine, and much may be said of it. Where lies your text? In Orsino's bosom. In his bosom? In what chapter of his bosom? To answer by the method in the first of his heart. Oh, I've read it. It's heresy. Have you no more to say? Good madam, let me see your face. Have you any commission from your lord to negotiate with my face? You are now out of your text. But we will draw the curtain and show you the picture. Look you, sir. Such a one I was, this present, is not well done. Excellently done. If God did all. It is in great, sir, to endure wind and weather. Tis beauty truly blent, whose red and white nature's own sweet and cunning hand laid on. 
Lady, you are the cruelest she alive if you will leave these graces to the grave and leave the world no copy. Oh, sir, I will not be so hard-hearted. I will send out diver schedules of my beauty. It shall be labelled in inventory to my will as item, two lips, indifferent red, item, two grey eyes with lids to them, item, one neck, one chin, and so forth. Were you sent hither to praise me? I see you what you are. You are too proud. If you were the devil, you are fair. My lord and master loves you. Oh, such love could be but recompense that you were crowned a non parade of beauty. How does he love me? With adorations, fertile tears, with groans that thunder love, with sighs of fire. Your lord does know my mind. I cannot love him. Yet I suppose him virtuous, know him noble, of great estate, of fresh and stainless youth, in voices well divulged, free, learned, and valiant, and, and in dimension in the shape of nature, a gracious person. Yet I cannot love him. He might have took his answer long ago. If I did love him in my master's flame, with such a suffering, such a deadly life, in your denial I would find no sense. I would not understand it. Why, who would you? Make me a willow cabin at your gate. And call upon my soul within the house. Write loyal cantons of condemned love and sing them loud, even in the dead of night. Halloo your name to the reverberate hills and make the babbling gossip of the air cry out, Oh, Livia! Oh, you would not rest between the elements of air and earth, but you would pity me. You might do much. What is your parentage? Above my fortunes, yet my state is well. I am a gentleman. Get you to your lord. I cannot love him. Let him send no more. Unless, perchance, you come to me again to tell me how he takes it. <laughs> Fair you well. I thank you for your pains. Spend this with me. I have no fee to post, lady. Keep your purse. My master, not myself, lacks recompense. Love make his heart a flint that you shall love. And let your fervour, like my master's, be placed in contempt. Farewell, fair cruelty. <laughs> oh, what is your parentage? Above my fortunes, yet my state is well. I am a gentleman. Oh, I'll be sworn thou art. Thy, thy tongue, thy face, Limbs, voice, actions, and spirit do give thee fivefold blazon. Not too fast, soft, soft, unless the master were the man. How now? Even so quickly may one catch the plague. Methinks I feel this youth's perfections with an invisible and subtle stealth to creep in at mine eyes. Well, let it be. What ho, Malvolio? Here, madam, at your service. Ran after that same peevish messenger, the county's man. He left this ring behind him. Would I or no? Tell him I'll none of it. Desire him not to flash with his lord, nor hold him up with hopes I am not for him. If that the youth will come this way again tomorrow, I'll give him reasons for it. <coughs> oh, highly, Malvolio. Madam, I <coughs> will. <coughs> I do, I know not what, and fear to find mine eye too great a flatterer for my mind. <coughs> Fate, show thy force, ourselves we do not owe. What is decreed <coughs> must be, and be this so! <coughs> Stay no longer, nor will you not that I go with you. By your patience, no. My stars shine darkly over me. The malignancy of my fate might perhaps distemper yours. Therefore, let me crave of you your leave that they may bear my evils alone. Let me know you. a bad recompense for your love to lay any of them on you. 
me know of you whither you are bound. Oh, sooth, sir, no, my determinate voyage is mere extravagancy. And yet I perceive in you so excellent a touch of modesty that you will not extort from me what I am willing to keep in. Therefore charges me in manners the rather to express myself. You must know of me then, Antonio. My name is Sebastian, which I did call Rodrigo. My father was that Sebastian of Messaline, whom I know you have heard of. He left behind him myself and a sister, both born in an hour. If the heavens had been pleased, would we had so ended, but you, sir, altered that. For some hour before you took me from the breach of the sea was my sister drowned. Alas, the day. Lady, sir, though it was said she much resembled me, was yet of many accounted beautiful. But though I could not with such estimable wonder over far believe that, yet thus far I will boldly publish her. She bore a mind that envy could not but call fair. She's drowned already, sir, with salt water. Though I seem to drown her remembrance again with more. Pardon me, sir, your bad entertainment. Good Antonio, forgive me your trouble. Let me be your servant. If you will not undo what you have done, that is, kill him whom you have recovered, desire it not. There you all at once. <laughs> My bosom is full of kindness, and, and I am yet so near the manners of my mother that upon the least occasion more my eyes will tell tales of me. Fare you well at once. I am bound to the Candlecito's court. The gentleness of all at God's go with thee. I have many enemies at Orsino's court, else would I very shortly see thee there. But come what may, I do adore thee so. The danger shall seem sport, and I will go. Save me my pains to have taken it away yourself. She adds, moreover, that you should put your lord into a desperate assurance she will none of him. And one thing more, that you be never so hardy to come again in his affairs, unless it be to report your lord's taking of this. Receive it so. She took the ring of me, I'll none of it. Come, sir. You peevishly threw it to her, and her will is it should be so returned, if it be worth stooping for. There it lies, in your eye. If not, be it his that finds it. I left no ring with her. What means this lady? For she forbid my outside hath not charmed her. Ha! She made good view of me. Indeed, so much that straight me thought her eyes had lost her tongue, for she did speak in starts distractedly. She loves me. Sure. The cunning of her passion invites me, this churlish messenger, none of my lord's ring. Why, he's there to none. I am the man. <laughs> if it be so, as tis, poor lady, she were better than a dream. Disguise. I see thou art a wickedness wherein the pregnant enemy does much. How easy it is for the proper false in women's waxen hearts to set their forms. Alas, our frailty is the cause, not we, for such as we are made, such we be. How will this fadge? My master loves her dearly, and I, poor monster, fond as much on him, and she, 
mistaken seems to dote on me. What will become of this? As I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. As I am woman, <laughs> now alas the day, what thriftless sigh shall poor Olivia breathe? Oh, time, thou must untangle this, not I. Tis too hard a knot for me to untie. Approach, Sir Andrew! <laughs> Not to be abed after midnight is to be up betimes and in luck, you know, staggery, thou knowest. Nay, by my troth, I know not. But I know to be up late is to be up late. The false conclusion! I hate it as an unfilled can. To be up after midnight and to go to bed then is to be early. So that to go to bed after midnight is to go to bed betimes. <laughs> That's not our lives. That consists of the four elements. Oh, faith, so they say, but I think it rather consists of eating and drinking. <laughs> that is scholar. Let us therefore eat and drink. Mariel, I say, stoop of wine. Well, here comes the folly face. <laughs> of we three. Welcome, ass. <laughs> now, let's have a song. <laughs> By my troth, the fool has an excellent breast. I had rather than forty shillings. I had such a leg and so sweet a breath to sing with as the fool does. In sooth, thou wast in very gracious fooling last night when thou spokest of pygrogrometers, of the vapians passing the equinoctial of queens. Hmm. It was very good in faith. I sent thee sixpence for thy leaven, hast it? I did in petticoats thy gratility, for Malvolio's nose is no ripstock. <laughs> My lady has a white hand, and the myrmidons are no bottle in a house. <laughs> this is the best fooling when all is done. Now, a song. Mm, there's sixpence for thee. Ooh. Let's have a song. And here's a test from me too, if one might give up. Would you have a love song or a song of good life? Oh, love song, a love song. I, I, I care not for good life. <coughs> <coughs> oh, mistress mine, where are you roaming? Oh, stay and hear my true love's coming. That can sing both high and low. Trip no further, pretty sweeting. Journeys end in lovers meeting. Every wise man's son doth know. Excellent, good effect. Good, good. What is love? Tis not hereafter. Present birth hath present laughter. What's to come is still unsure. In delay there lies no plenty. Then come kiss me, sweet and twenty. <laughs> Use of stuff will not endure. <laughs> Liveless voice as I am a true knight. A contagious breath. <sighs> Very sweet and contagious, if faith. Mm, to hear by the nose it is dulcet in contagion. But shall we make the welkin dance indeed? Shall we rouse the night owl in a catch oh, that will draw three souls from one weaver? Oh, Shall we do that? Oh, you love me, let's do it. I'm a dog in a cat. Oh, oh, I'm a lady, sir, and some dogs will catch one well. out. <laughs> and they are catch me, thou knave. Oh, yes. Hold thy peace, thou knave. <clears throat> I shall be constrained in to call thee knave, knight. Well, it is not the first time I've constrained someone to call me knave. Uh, begin, Bully begins. Hold thy peace. <laughs> we are politicians, Malvolians of Pegaramsey, and three men in the 
am I not consanguineous? <laughs> am I not of her blood? Chilly belly. <laughs> they dwelt a man in Babylon. <laughs> 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 yourself and your misdemeanors. You are welcome to the house. If not, and it please you to take leave of her, she is very willing to bid you farewell. <gasps> farewell, dear heart, since I must needs be gone. Hey, sweet Sir Toby. His eyes to show his days almost done. Is it even so? But I will to you. <laughs> Shall I bid him go? Yes, sir, if you do. Shall I bid him go and spare not? No, 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 you dare not. Out of tune, sir, ye lie. Art any more than a steward? Dost thou think that because thou art virtuous, there should be no more cakes and ale? Aye, Boston Town. And ginger shall be hot in the mouth too! Not in a right go, sir! Rub your chain with crumbs! Swine <laughs> ring! Mistress Mary, if you prize my lady's favour at anything more than contempt, you would not give means for this uncivil rule. She shall know of it by this hand! drink when a man's a hungry, to challenge him in the field, and then to break promise with him and make a fool of him. I'll write to your challenge! Or oh, I'll deliver my indignation to him by word of mouth. Nay, sweet Sir Toby, be patient for tonight. Since the youth of the Count was today with my lady, she is much out of quiet. And Monsieur Malvolio, let me alone with him. If I do not gull him into an A-word and make him a common recreation, do not think I have wit enough to lie straight in my bed. I know I can do it. Possessors, possessors, tell us something of him. Marries. Sometimes he is a kind. A purist! <laughs> oh, if I thought that, I'd treat him like a dog. What, for being a purist? That exquisite reason, dear knight. 
Well, I have no exquisite reason for it, but I have reason good enough. The devil a puritan as he is, or anything constantly, but a time pleaser, an affectioned ass that can't state without book, and offers it by great swathes, the best persuaded of himself, so crammed as he thinks with excellencies, that tis his grounds of faith that all that look on him, love him. And on that voice in him will my revenge find notable cause to work. Oh, what wilt thou do? I will jot in his way some obscure epistles of love, wherein, by the colour of his beard, the shape of his leg, the manner of his gait, the expression of his eye, forehead, and complexion, he will find himself most feelingly personated. Oh, I can write very like my lady, your niece. But the forgotten matter, we can hardly make distinction of our hands. Excellent. I smell a device. I have it in my nose too. <laughs> he will think by the letters thou wilt drop that they come from my niece and that she is in love. With him! My purpose is indeed a horse of that colour. Oh. <laughs> and your horse now will make him an ass! Oh. Oh. I doubt not. Oh, it will be admirable. Sport royal, I warrant you. <laughs> I will plant we two, and let the fool make a third. Oh. Where I shall find the letter. Observe his construction of it. For this night, to bed! <laughs> Dream on the event. Farewell! Oh, night, Prentice Leia. Before me. She is a good wench. She's a beagle true bred. <laughs> and one that adores me. <laughs> what of that? I was adored once too. <laughs> Come, knight, let's to bed. Thou hast need send for more money. If I can't recover your niece, I'm a foul way out. Send for money, knight. If thou hast her not in the end, call me a cut. And I do not, never trust me. Take it how you will. Uh, oh. Come, come. Now go burn some sack. It's too late to go to bed now. Uh. <coughs> 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 song, that old and antique song we heard last night. Methought it did relieve my passion much, more than light airs and recollected terms of these most brisk and guinea-paced times. Come, but one verse. Oh. He is not here, so please your lordship that should sing it. Uh, uh, who was it? Best day the jester, my lord. A fool that the lady Olivia's father took much delight in. He is about the house. Seek him out, and play the tune the while. Come hither, boy. <laughs> if ever thou shalt love, when the sweet pangs of it remember me, for such as I am, all true lovers are, unstayed and skittish in all motions else, save in the constant image of the creature that is beloved. How dost thou like this tune? It gives a very echo to the seat where love is throned. How to speak masterly? My life upon Young, though thou art, thine eye hath stayed upon some favour that it loves, hath it not, boy? A little, by your favour. What kind of woman is it? Your complexion. She is not worth thee, then. What years, if faith? About your years, my lord. Too old, by heaven. Still, let a woman take an elder than herself. So, where is she to him? So sway she level in her husband's heart. For boy, however we do praise ourselves, our fancies are more giddy and unfirm, more longing, wavering, sooner lost and won. 
from women's heart. I think it well, my lord. Uh, then let thy love be younger than thyself, or thy affection cannot hold the bent. For women are as roses whose fair flower, being once displayed, doth fall that very hour. And so they are. Alas, that they are so. To die, even when they to perfection grow. <laughs> oh, fellow, come, that song we heard last night. <clears throat> Mark it, Cesario. It is old and plain. The spinsters and the knitters in the sun and the free maids that weave their thread with bones who used to chant it. It is silly sooth and <laughs> dallies with the innocence of love. Like the old age. Are you ready, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I pretty <really> sit. <clears throat> Business everywhere. For well, that's it that always makes a good voyage and nothing. Eh? Farewell. Once more, good Cesario, get thee to yon same sovereign cruelty. Tell her, my love, more noble than the world, prizes not quantity of dirty lands. Those parts that fortune hath bestowed on her, tell her I prize as giddily as fortune. But is that miracle and queen of gems that nature pranks her in attracts my soul? But if she cannot love you, sir? I cannot be so answered. Sooth, but you must. Say that some lady, as perhaps there is, <laughs> hath been for your love as great a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. You cannot love her. You tell her so. Must she not then be answered? There is no woman's heart by the beating of so strong a passion as love hath given my heart. No woman's heart so big to hold so much. They lack retention. Alas, the love may be called appetite. No motion of the liver, but the palate that suffers surfeit, employment, and revolt. But mine is all as hungry as the sea. 
and can digest as much. Make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. Aye, but I know. What dost thou know? Too well what love women to men may owe. In faith they are as true of heart as we. My father had a daughter, loved a man. As it might be, perhaps, were I a woman, I should do lordship. And what's her history? A blank, my lord. She never told her love. But let concealment like a worm in the bird feed on her damask cheek. She pined in thought. And with a green and yellow melancholy, she sat like patience on a monument, smiling at grief. <laughs> Was not this love indeed? We men may say more, swear more, but indeed our shows are more than will. For still we prove much in our vows, but little in our love. But die thy sister of her love, my boy? I am all the daughters of my father's house, and all the brothers too. And yet I know not. Sir, so shall I to this lady? Aye, that's the thing. Uh, to her in haste, give her this ring. Say, my love can give no place, bide no dinner. Here comes the little villain. <laughs> How now, my metal of India? Get me into the box tree. Malvolio is coming down this walk. He's been yonder in the sun, practicing behaviors to his own shadow this half hour. Observe him for the love of mockery, for I know this letter will make a contemplative idiot out of him. Oh, in the name of destiny, oh, 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 lie down there. For here comes the trout who must be caught with tickling. Tis but fortune. All <laughs> is fortune. Maria once told me she did affect me. And I have heard herself come thus near that should she fancy it should be one of my complexion. Besides, she uses me with a more exalted respect than anyone else that follows her. What should I think of it? Psst! He is an overweening rogue. Contemplation makes a rare turkey cock of him. How he jets under his advanced plumes. Oh, so like I could so beat the rogue. Peace, I say. To be count Malvolio. That rogue. Pistol him. Pistol him. Oh, peace. There's example for it. The lady of the straight she married the yeoman of the wardrobe. Fight on him, Jezebel. Having been three months married to her, Sitting in my state, over a stone bowl, I hit him in the eye, calling my officers about me in my branched velvet gown, having come from a daybed where I have left <laughs> Olivia sleeping. Why don't you break so? Peace, I say. And then to have the humour of state, and after a demure travel of regard, telling them I know my place as I would they should do theirs, to ask for my kinsman, Toby. Colts and shackles! <laughs> Seven of my people, with an obedient start, make out of him. I frown the while and perchance wind up my watch, or play with some rich jewel. Toby approaches. <laughs> Curtsies there to me. Shall this fellow be? Though our silence be torn from us with cause, yet peace. I extend my hand to him thus, quenching my familiar smile with an austere regard of control. And just don't be your fetch you a blow on the lips, then! <laughs> 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 Say, Cousin Toby, my fortunes having cast me on your niece, 
give me this prerogative of speech. What? what? You must amend your drunkenness. Don't scare me! Hold a patience. We bring the sinews of our plot. Besides, you waste the treasure of your time with a foolish knight. Sir Andrew, I warrant you. One Sir Andrew. I knew it would be him. Many more. <laughs> <laughs> what employment have we here? Now is the woodcock in the chair. Oh, peace! And the spirit of humour is to make reading aloud to him. By my life, this is my lady's hand. These be her very C's, her U's and her T's, and thus make she her great P's. <laughs> it is in contempt of question, her hand. <laughs> her C's, her U's and her T's, why that? <laughs> <laughs> to the unknown beloved, this and my good wishes, her very phrases, by your leave, wax, and the impression will increase with which he uses to seal. It is my lady's hand. To whom should this be? This wins in liver and all. Jove knows I love, but who? Lips do not move. No man must know. What follows? No man must know. The numbers altered. No man must know. If this should be thee, Malvolio. Mary, hang me, Brock. I may command where I adore, but silence like Lucrece's knife with bloodless stroke my heart doth gore. M O A I doth sway my life. A fustian riddle? Excellent wench, say I. M O A I. But first, let me see, let me see, let me see. Oh, what a dish of poison hast thou laced it, but we've got wing the stab your cheeks at it. <laughs> I may command where I adore. Why she may command me? I serve her, she is my lady. This is evident to any formal capacity. There is no obstruction in this. And the end. What should that alphabetical position pretend? If I could make something in that resemble me, soft, M-O-A-I. Oh my, he's now in a cold scent, oh, make out that. Stout will cry out for all that, though it be rank as a fox. M. Malvolio! M-Y, that begins my name. Did not I say why did out to her as excellent as fox? M. But there is no consonancy in the sequel. That suffers under probation. A should follow, but O does. I know shall end, I hope. Aye, or I'll cut him and make him cry, oh! And then I comes behind. Aye, and you have any eye behind you, you might see more detraction in your heels than fortunes before you. M-O-A-I. This simulation is not as the former, but to crush it a little, it would Bow to me, for every one of these letters are in my name. Soft. Here follows prose. If this fall into thy hand, revolve. In my stars I am above thee, but be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. And to inure thyself to what thou art like to be, cast thy humble slough and appear fresh. Be opposite with kinsmen, surly with servants, let thy tongue tang arguments of state, put thyself into the trick of singularity. She thus advises thee that sighs for thee. Remember who commended thy yellow stockings and wished to see thee ever cross garter. I say, remember, her go to thou art made if thou desires to be so. If not, let me see thee a steward still. Go to the fellow servants and not worthy to touch fortune's fingers. Farewell, she that would 
all to service is with thee, the fortunate and happy. Daylight and champagne discovers not more. This is open. I will be proud. I will read politic authors. I will baffle Sir Toby. I will wash off gross acquaintance. I will be point device, the very man. I no longer fool myself to let imagination jade me for every reason excites to this. My lady loves me. She did commend my yellow stockings. She did praise my leg being cross-gartered. And then this, she manifests herself to my love and with a kind of injunction drives me to these habits of her liking. I thank my stars. I am happy. I will be strange stout in yellow stockings and cross garters, even with the swiftness of putting on. Jove will my stars be praised. Here is yet a postscript. Thou canst not choose but know who I am. If thou entertainst my love, let it appear in thy smiling. <laughs> thy smiles become thee well. Therefore, in my presence, still smile. Dear my sweet, I prithee. Jove, I thank thee. I will smile. I will do whatever thou wilt have me. Give up my part in this sport for a pension of thousands to be paid from a sofa. I, oh, oh, oh. I could marry thee, wench, for this device <laughs> and ask for no further dally with thee but just such another jest. My noble god catcher, wilt thou set thy foot on my neck? <laughs> Thou hast placed him in such a dream that when the image of it leaves him, he must run mad. Ah, if you will then see the fruits of the sport, mark his first approach before my lady. He will come to her in yellow stockings and to the colour she abhors, in cross garters, a fashion she detests, and he will smile upon her, which will be so unsuitable to her disposition, being addicted to a melancholy as she is that it cannot but turn it into a notable contempt. Yeah. If you will see it, follow me. To the gates of Tata, the most excellent devil of wit. Matter, sir, I do live by the church, for I do live at my house, and my house does stand by the church. So thou mayest say the king lie by a beggar if a beggar dwell near him, or the church stand by thy table if thy table stand by the church. You have said, sir, see this age, a sentence is but the cheveral glove to a good whip, how quickly the wrong side may be turned outward. I warrant thou art a merry fellow and cares for nothing. Not so, sir, I do care for something. But in my conscience, sir, I do not care for you. If that be to care for nothing, sir, I would it would make you invisible. Oh, not that the Lady Olivia's fool. Ah, indeed, sir. The Lady Olivia hath no folly. She'll keep no fool till she be married. And fools are as like husbands, as pilchards are the herrings. The husband's the bigger. <laughs> I'm indeed not her fool, but her corrupter of words. I saw thee late at the Count Orsino's. 
Thornary surface walk about the orb like the sun. It shines everywhere. I would be sorry, sir, but the fault should be as off with your master as with my mistress. I think I saw your wisdom there. Nay, hey, now pass upon me. I'll no more with thee. Hold. There's expenses for thee. Oh. Jove in his next commodity of hair, send thee a beard. By my troth, I'll tell thee, I am almost sick for one. <laughs> I would not have it grow on my chin. Is thy lady within? My lady is within, sir. I will consider them whence you come. Who you are and what you would are out of my welkin. I might say element, but the word is overboard. <laughs> this fellow is wise enough to play the fool, and to do that well craves a kind of wit. He must observe their mood on hilly jests, the quality of persons, and the time, and like the haggard, check at every feather that comes before his eye. This is a practice as full of labour as a wise man's art, for folly that he wisely shows is fit, but wise men, folly fallen, quite taint their bit. Save you, gentlemen. And you, sir. Dear God, monsieur. Et vous aussi votre serviteur. I hope so you are, and I am yours. Will you in kind to the house? My niece is desirous you should enter if your trade be there. I am bound to your niece, sir. I mean, she is the list of my voyage. I taste your legs, sir. Put them to motion. My legs do better understand me, sir, than I understand what you mean by bidding me taste my legs. <laughs> I mean to go, sir. Do enter. I will answer with gate and entrance. <laughs> <laughs> but we are prevented. Most excellent, accomplished lady, the heavens rain odours on you. Oh, that youth is a rare courtier. Rain odours? Well. But my matter hath no voice, lady, but to your own most pregnant and vouchsafed ear. Odours pregnant and vouchsafed? I'll get them all three ready. Let the garden door be shut and leave me to my hearing. Give me your hand, sir. My duty, madam, and most humble service. What is your name? Cesario is your servant's name, fair princess. Oh, my servant, sir. It was never merry world since lowly feigning was called compliment. Thou art servant to the Count Orsino, youth. And he is yours. And his must needs be yours. Your servant's servant is your servant, Adam. For him? I think not on him. For his thoughts? But they were blank rather than filled with me. Madam, I come to whet your gentle thoughts on his behalf. I will leave, I pray you. I bade you never speak again of him. Would you undertake another suit? I would rather hear you to solicit that than music from the spheres. Oh, dear lady! Give me leave to see you. I did send, after the last enchantment you did hear, a ring in chase of you. So did I abuse myself, my servant, and I do fear me you. Under your hard construction must I sit. To force that on you in a shameful cunning which you knew none of yours. What might you think? Have you not set my honour at stake, and made you with all the unmuzzled thoughts that tyrannous heart can think? A cypress, not a bosom, hides my heart. So let me hear you speak. I pity you. Oh, well, that's a degree to love. No, not a prize. For tis a vulgar proof that very oft we pity enemies. Why then we think it's time to smile again. Oh, world, how at the par poor are to be proud. If one should be a prey, how much the better to fall before the lion and the wolf. <coughs> be not afraid, good youth. I will not have you. And yet when wit and youth are come to harvest, your wife is like to reap a proper man. There lies your way, due west. Then westward ho. Grace and good disposition attend your ladyship. You're nothing, madam, to my lord, by me. Stay! I prithee tell me what thou thinkst of me. That you do think you are not what you are. Oh, if I think so, I think the same of you. Or think you right, I am not what I am. <laughs> <laughs> I would you were as I would have you be. Would you be better, madam, than I am? I wish it might, for now I am your fool. Oh. What a deal of scorn looks beautiful in the contempt and anger of his lip. A murderous guilt shows not itself more soon than love that would seem hid. Love's night is noon. Cesario, by the roses of the spring, by maidhood, honour, truth, and everything, I love thee so, the more all thy pride. 
hide, nor hurt, nor reason can my passion hide. Do not extort thy reason from this clause, for that I woo. Thou therefore hast no cause, but rather reason thus with reason better. Love sought is good, but given unsought is better. By innocence I swear, and by my youth, I have one heart, one bosom, and one truth, and that no woman has, nor ever run, shall mistress to steal it, save I alone. And so good, stupid madam, no more, when I am the master's tears to you, deploy I come again. For thou perhaps face move this heart which now pours to like his love. No, Faith, I'll not stay a job longer. Thy reason, dear Venom, give thy reason. Mary, I saw your niece do more famous the Count Sterling man than ever she bestowed on me. I saw it in the orchard. Did she see thee the while, old boy? Tell me that. As plain as you see me now. This was a great argument of love in her toward you. Slut, will you make an ass of me? I will prove it legitimate, sir, upon the oath of judgment and reason. Then they have been grand jurymen since before Noah was a sailor. She did show favour to the youth in your sight, only to exasperate you, to awake your dormouse valour, to put fire in your heart and brimstone in your liver. You should have accosted her, and with some excellent jests, fire new from the mint, you should have banged the youth into dumbness. This was looked for in your hand, and this was balked. The double guilt of this opportunity you have let time wash off, and you are now sailed into the north of my lady's opinion, where you will hang like an icicle on the Dutchman's beard. <laughs> Unless you do redeem it by some laudable attempt either of valour or policy. Can it be anyway, it must be with valour. For policy I hate. Why then build me thy fortunes upon the basis of valour? Challenge me, the Count's youth, to fight with him, hurt him in eleven places. My niece shall take note of it, and assure thyself there is no love broker in the world can more prevail in man's commendation with woman than report of valour. There is no way but this, Sir Andrew. Will either of you bear me a challenge to him? Go, write it in a martial hand. Be cursed and brief. It is no matter how witty, so it be eloquent and full of invention. <laughs> Taunt him with the license of ink. Go about it. Let them be gone now with my ink, though thou write with a goose pen, no matter about it. Well, where shall I find you? We will call thee at the cubiculo. Go, 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 go. <laughs> We shall have a rare letter from it. But you'll not deliver it. Never trust me then. <sighs> and by all means, stir on the youth to an answer. I think oxen and wing ropes cannot hail them together. <laughs> but Andrew, if you are open and you find so much blood in his liver as will clog the foot of a flea, I'll eat the rest of the anatomy. And it's the opposite. The youth has in his visage no great presage of cruelty. <laughs> oh, look where the youngest oh. red of nine comes. If you desire the spleen and will laugh yourself into stitches, follow me. Yon gull Malvolio's turned he oh. He's in yellow stock. Oh, and cross garden. Most villainously, he does obey every point of the letter that I drop to betray him. He does smile his face into more lies than is in the new map with the augmentation of the Indies. You have not seen such a thing as tis. I can hardly prepare hurling things at him. I know my lady will strike him. If she do, he'll smile and take it for a great favour. Come, bring us, bring us where he is. <laughs> I would not, by my will, have troubled you. But since you make your pleasure of your pains, I will no further chide you. I could not stay behind you. Oh, my complaint, Antonio. I can no other answer make but thanks. But, but were my worth, as is my conscience firm, you should find better dealing. What's to do? Shall we go see the relics of this town? Tomorrow, sir, let's first go see your lodging. I am not weary, and tis long tonight. I pray you, let us satisfy our eyes with memorials and the things of fame that do renown this city. Would you pardon me, I do not without danger walk these streets. 
Once in a sea fight against the county's galleys, I did some service of such note indeed that were I tea and here, it would scarce be answered. Be like you slew great number of his men. The offence is not of such a bloody nature, albeit the quality of the time and quarrel might well have given us bloody argument. It might have since been answered in repaying what we took from them, which for traffic's sake most of our city did. Only myself stood out for which, if I be lapsed in this place, I shall pay dear. Do not walk then too open. It doth not fit me. Hold, sir! Here's my purse. In the south suburbs at the Elephant is best to lodge. I will bespeak our diet, whilst you beguile the time and feed your knowledge with viewing of the town. There shall you have me. Why I your purse? Perchance your eye shall light upon some toy. It hath desire to purchase. And your store, I think, sir, is not for idle markets. I'll be your purse bearer and leave you for an hour. To the elephant! I do remember! I have sent for him. He says he'll come. How shall I feast him? What bestow of him? For youth is bought more oft than begged or borrowed. I speak too loud. For where's Malvolio? He is sad and civil, and suits well for a servant with my fortunes. Where is Malvolio? He's coming. In very strange manner. He is short possessed. What's the matter? Does he rave? No. He does nothing but smile. Well, I'll call him hither. I'm as mad as he. Yeah. If sad and merry madness equal be, how now, Malvolio? <laughs> Sweet lady. <laughs> ho, ho! <laughs> Smiles thou? I sent for thee upon a sad occasion. <laughs> sad lady? I could be sad. This does make some obstruction in the blood, this cross guard. But <laughs> if it please the eye of one, it is with me as a very true sonnet is. Please one, and please all. <laughs> Why, how dost thou, man? What's the matter with thee? Not black in my mind, though yellow in my legs. <laughs> it came to his hands, and command shall be answered. I think we do know. The sweet Roman hand. Did <laughs> thou go to bed, Malvolio? To bed? I, sweetheart, and I'll come to thee. <laughs> Good comfort thee. Why dost thou smile so and kiss thy hand so oft? How do you, Malvolio? Be not afraid of greatness. Twas well writ. Means thou by that, Malvolio? Some are born great. Ah. Some achieve greatness. Well, Sayest thou? And some have greatness thrust upon her. Oh, I have restored thee. Remember who commended thy yellow stocking. Thy yellow stockings? And did ever wish to see thee cross gartered. <laughs> cross gartered? Go to, thou art made if thou desirest to be so. Am I made? If not, let me see thee a servant still. Why, this is very midsummer madness. <laughs> Madam, the young gentleman of the Colonel see knows this return. Oh, I could hardly entreat him back. He attends your ladyship's pleasure. Tell him I'll come to him. Uh, let this fellow be looked to. Where was my cousin Toby? Let some of my people have a special care of him. I would not have him miscarried for the half of my dowry. Oh, good Mariah! Oh, ho! Do you come near me now? No worse man than Sir Toby took to me. This concurs directly with the letter. She sends him on purpose that I may appear stubborn to him, for she incites me to that in the letter. Cast thy humble slough, says she, be opposite with kinsmen. Surly with servants, let thy tongue tang with arguments of state. Put thyself into the trick of singularity. I have lied her! But it is Jove's doing, and Jove make me thankful. And when she went away now, let this fellow be looked to. Fellow! Not Malvolio, nor after my degree, but a fellow. Why? 
everything adheres together. What can be said? Nothing that can be can come between me and the true prospect of my hopes. Well, Jove, not I, is the doer of this, and he is to be thanked. Which way is he in the name of sanctity? If, if all the devils of hell be drawn in little and legion himself possessing it, I'll speak to him. Here he is, here he is. How is with you, sir? How is it with you, man? Go off. <laughs> I discard you. Let me enjoy my private. <coughs> Go off! No, oh, how hollow the fiend speaks within him. Oh, Sir Toby, my lady, told you to have a special care of him. Ah, uh -huh, does she, sir? Go to, go to, peace, peace. You must deal gently with him. Let me alone. How do you, Malvolio? How is it with you? <laughs> what man? Defy the devil! Consider, he's an enemy to mankind. Do you know what you say? How are you? And you speak ill of the devil how he takes it at heart? Pray God he be not. Be rich. <gasps> Carry his water to the wise woman. Marry and it shall be done tomorrow morning if I late. My lady would not lose him for more than I said. Now, now, mistress! <gasps> oh, Lord! Oh, oh, pray thee, hold thy peace. This is not the way. Do you not see you move him? Let me alone with him. No way for gentleness. Gently, gently. The feed is rough. Will not be roughly used. <clears throat> and now, my poor cock! How oh, dost thou chuck? <laughs> I bid thee, come with me. <laughs> what man? Tis not for gravity to play a cherry pit with Satan. Hand him, fellow courier! Get him to say his prayers. Oh, good Sir Toby, get him to pray. My prayers, Mix? No, I warrant you, he'll not hear of godliness. <laughs> Go, hang yourselves all. You are idle, shallow things. I am not of your element. You shall know more hereafter. <laughs> Is it possible? <laughs> if this were played upon a stage now, I could condemn it as an improbable fiction. <laughs> Very genius, I've oh. taken the infection of the device, man. <laughs> Why, well, we shall make it mad indeed. <gasps> the house will be the quiet. Come, 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 come. We'll have him in a dark room and bound. Uh, my niece is already in the belief that he's mad. We may carry it thus for our pleasure and his penance till our very past time, tired out of breath, prompt us to have mercy on him, at which time we will bring the device to the bar and crown thee oh. for a finder of madmen. <laughs> oh, but see, but see. More matter for a May morning. Here's the letter. Read it. I roll that there is vinegar and pepper in it. It's so saucy. Ah, yes. Do but read. Give me. <clears throat> Youth, whatsoever thou art, thou art but a scurvy fellow. Good and valiant. Wonder not, nor admire not in thy mind why I do call thee so, for I will show thee no reason for it. A good note that keeps you from the blow of the law. Thou comest to the Lady Olivia, and in my sight she uses thee kindly. But thou liest in thy throat! That is not the matter I challenge thee for. Very brief, and to exceeding good sense. Yes. I will waylay thee going home, where if it be thy chance to kill me, good. thou killst me like a rogue and a villain. Still thou keepst on the windy side of the law, good. Fare thee well, and God have mercy upon one of our souls. He may have mercy upon mine, but my hope is better, and so look to thyself. Thy friend, as thou usest him, and thy sworn enemy, 
Andrew Aguecheek. If this letter move him not, his legs cannot. I'll give him. You may have very good occasion for it, for he is now in some commerce with my lady, and will by and by depart. Go, Sir Andrew! Scout me for him in the corner of the orchard like a bum bailey. So soon as ever thou seest him, draw! And as thou drawst, swear horrible. <laughs> Before it comes to pass oft that a terrible oath, in a swaggering accent, sharply twanged off, gives manhood more approbation than ever proof itself would have earned him. Away! Nay! Let me alone for swearing! <laughs> <laughs> now, will not I deliver this letter? For the behaviour of the young gentleman gives him out to be of good capacity in breeding. His employment between his lord and my niece confirms no less. Therefore this letter, being so excellently ignorant, can breed no terror in the youth. He will find that it comes from a clodpole. Uh. But truly, and will deliver his challenge by word of mouth. Set upon Ague Cheek notable report of valour, and so drive the gentlemen, as I know his youth will aptly receive it, into a most hideous opinion of his rage, skill, fury, and impetuosity. <laughs> this will so fright them both that they will kill one another by the look, like cockatrices. <laughs> oh, oh, here he comes now with my niece. I will meditate the while upon some horrid message for a challenge. <laughs> I have said too much. Into a heart of stone, and laid mine honour too uncherry on it. There's something in me does reprove my fault. Yet such a headstrong, potent fault it is that it but mocks reproof. With such haviour that your passion bears goes on my master's griefs. Here, take this from me. It is my picture. Refuse it not. It has no tongue to vex you. And I beseech you, come again tomorrow. What would you ask of me that I'll deny? That honour saved may upon asking give? Nothing but this? Your true love for my master? How with my honour may I give him that which I have given to you? I will acquit you! <sighs> well, come again tomorrow. Fare thee well. A fiend like thee might bear my soul to hell. Gentlemen! God save thee! And you, sir. Oh, that defence thou hast, betake thee to it. Of what nature the wrongs are thou hast done him, I know not. But thy interceptor, full of despite, bloody as the hunter, attends thee at the orchard end. Dismount thy tuck, be here in thy preparation, for thy assailant is quick, skilful, and deadly. You mistake, sir. Mm. I am sure no man hath any quarrel to me. My remembrance is very free and clear of any image of offence done to any man. You'll find it otherwise, I assure you. Therefore, if you value your life at any price, betake you to your guard, for your opposite hath in him what youth, strength, skill, and wrath can furnish man with all. I pray you, sir, what is he? He is not! <laughs> Stuffed with unhatched rapier, but non carpet consideration, but he's a devil in a private brawl. <laughs> Souls and bodies have he divorced free, and his incensement is at this moment so implacable that satisfaction can be none but by pangs of death and civil girl. Oh, I will return again into the house and desire some conduct of the lady. I am no fighter. I have heard of some kind of men that put quarrels purposely on others to taste their valour. Belike, this is a man of that quirk. Sir, no! His indignation derives itself out of a very competent injury. Therefore, get you on and give him his desire. But you shall not to the house, unless you undertake that with me, which with as much safety you might answer him. Therefore, on, or strip your sword, stark naked for meddle you must, that certain offer swear to wear iron about you. This is as uncivil as strange. I beseech you, do me the courteous office as to know of the knight what my offence to him is. Mm. It no. is something of my negligence, nothing of my purpose. I will do so. Uh, say your first day. Stay you by this gentleman till my return. Pray you, sir, do you know of this matter? I know the knight is incensed against you, sir, even to a mortal arbitrament, but nothing of the circumstance more. I beseech you, what murder of man is he? Oh, he is indeed, sir. 
the most skillful, bloody, and fatal opposite that you could possibly have found in any part of Illyria. Will you walk towards him? I will make your peace with him, if I can. Oh, I shall be much bound to you for it. I am one that would rather go with Sir Priest than Sir Knight. I care not who knows so much of my men. Why, man, he's a very devil. I have not seen such a virago. I had a pass with him, read me a scabbard and all, and he gives me the stacking with such a mortal motion that it is inevitable. And on the answer, he pays you as surely as your feet hits the ground they step upon. They say he must be fenced to the sofa. Pox on it, I will meddle with him. Aye, but he will not now be pacified. Festing can scarce hold him yonder. Plagued. Well, I thought he had been valiant and cunning and fence on a singing down there. I would have challenged him. Let him let the matter slip, and I'll give him my horse. Great cabinet. Well, I'll make the motion. Stand there, make a good shot. This shall end without the perdition of souls. <laughs> Mally, I'll ride your horse as well as I ride you. <laughs> <laughs> I have his horse to take up the quarrel. I have persuaded him to use the devil. <laughs> He's as horribly conceited of him and pants and looks pale as if a bear were at his heel. <laughs> There's no remedy, sir. Uh, he will fight you for his own sake. Marry, he had better be thought him of his quarrel, and he finds that now scarce to be worth talking oh. on. <laughs> Therefore, draw for the supportance of his vow. He protests he will not hurt you. Oh, pray God defend me. The little thing would make me tell them how much I lack of a man. He grabbed if you see him furious. Oh, come, Sir Andrew, there is no remedy. The gentleman will, for his honour's sake, have one bout with you. He cannot buy the two hell, no, avoid it. But he has promised me, as he is a soldier and a gentleman, he will not hurt you. Come on, oh, do it. Preach, go in, kiss his arms. I do assure you, just against my will. Ah! Dares yet do more than you have heard him brat you, he will. Nay, and you be an undertaker. I am for you! Hey, good to show me. Oh, here comes the officer. I'll be with you, or not? Pray, sir, put your sword up if you please. This is the man, Antonio. I arrest you at the seat of Count Orsino. You mistake me, sir. No, sir, no jot. I know your favour well. This comes with seeking you, but there's no remedy. I shall answer it. What will you do? Now my necessity makes me to ask you for my purse. Oh, it grieves me much more for what I cannot do for you than what befalls myself. Come oh, stand sir. amazed, but be of comfort. I must entreat of you some of that money. What money, sir? For the fair kindness you have showed me here, and part being prompted by your present trouble, out of my lean and low ability, I'll lend you something. Hold, oh, there's half my copper. What are you denying me now? Is it possible my deserts to you can lack persuasion? Take not my misery lest it make me so unsound a man as to upbraid you with those kindnesses that I have done for you. I know of none, nor know I you by voice or any other feature. I hate ingratitude more in a man than lying, vainness, babbling, drunkenness, or any taint of vice whose strong corruption inhabits our frail blood. Oh, heavens themselves! Come, oh, sir, I pray you go. Let me speak a little. This youth that you see here, I snatched one half out of the jaws of death, relieved him with such sanctity of love, and to his image, which we thought did promise most venerable worth, did I devotion. 
Back to us as oh. time goes by. Okay. How violent are you through this god? Thou hast Sebastian, Duncan Fincher, shame. And nature, there's no blemish but the mind. None can be caught in fault but the unkind. The man grows mad. Away with him. Come, come, sir. Lead me on. He thinks his words do from such passion fly that he believes himself. So do not I. Prove true imagination. Oh, prove true that I, dear brother, be now tame for you. Come hither, knight. Come hither, Veste. We'll whisper Earl a couple of you a most sage swords. He named Sebastian. I, my brother, know yet living in my glass. Even such and so in favour was my brother, and he went still in his colour, fashion, ornament. For him I imitate. Oh, if it prove, tempests are kind, and salt waves fresh in love. A very dishonest, paltry boy, and more a coward than a hare. A coward. His dishonesty appears in leaving his friend here in necessity and denying you. The most devout coward, religious in it. Oh, Oh, we get a beating! Do! Cuff him soundly, but never draw thy sword! And I do not! Come, let's see the event. I dare lay any money, it will be nothing yet.
Let fancy still my sense in Lethe steep. If it be thus to dream, still let me sleep. Nico, I prithee, would thou be ruled by me? Madam, I will. Oh, say so, and so be. Time boy, for the hay, hold oh, the wind of the rain. A foolish thing was but a toy, for the rain it raineth. <laughs> Nay, put on this gown and this cross, make him believe thou art Sir Topaz, the curate. Do it quickly. I'll call Mr. Toby the while. Well, I will put it on, and I will dissemble myself in it. I know I'll be the first I ever dissembled in such a gown. The competitors enter. <laughs> Joe, bless thee, Master Barton. Oh, Buenos dias, Sir Toby. <laughs> For as the old hermit of Prague that never saw pen and ink very wisely said to a niece of King Gorbadoc, that, that is, is. So I, being Master Parson, am Master Parson. For what is that, 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 and is, but is? Do <laughs> him, Sir Gerard. Counterfeits well, a good knave. Who calls sir? Sir Topaz, the curate, come to visit Malvolio, the lunatic. Sir Topaz, Sir Topaz, good Sir Topaz, go to my lady. Out, hyperbolical fiend! How vexest thou this man? Talkest thou nothing but of ladies? Well said, Master Brasson. Sir Topaz, never was man thus wronged. Good Sir Topaz. I do not think I am mad. They are laid to him in hideous darkness. Fully, thou dishonest Satan! I call thee by the most modest terms, for I am one of those gentle ones that will use the devil himself with courtesy. Sayest thou that house is dark? It's hell, Sir Topaz. Why? It hath bay windows transparent as barricados, and the clearest stories in the South North are as lustrous as ebony. And yet complainest thou of obstruction? I say I am not mad, Sir Topaz, and I say to you, this house is dark. Madman, thou earnest. I say to you, there is no madness but ignorance, in which thou art more puzzled than the Egyptians in their fog. I say this house is as dark as ignorance, though ignorance were as dark as hell. And I say there was never man thus abused. I am no more mad than you are. Make trial of it in any constant question. What is the opinion of Pythagoras concerning wild fowl? That the soul of our granddad might happily inhabit a bird. And what thinkest thou of his opinion? I think nobly of the soul and in no way approve his opinion. Very well. Remain thou still in darkness. Thou shalt hold the opinion of Pythagoras ere I will allow of thy right wits. And fear to kill a woodcock, lest thou dispossess the soul of thy grandam. Very well! Sir Topaz! Sir Topaz! Oh, my most exquisite Sir Topaz! Hey, I am for all waters. <laughs> you might have done it without the gown and cross. He sees thee not. <laughs> to him, in thine own voice, and, and bring me word how thou finds him. I would we were well rid of this knavery. If he may be conveniently delivered, I would he were. For I am now so far in offence with my niece that I cannot pursue with any safety this sport to the upshot. Come by and by to my chamber. Hey, Robin, jolly Robin, tell me how thy lady does. Fool. Thy lady is unkind, Paddy. Fool. Alas, why is she so? Fool, I say. She loves another. Who calls her? Good fool, as ever thou wilt deserve well at my hand, help me to a candle and some pen, ink and paper. As I am a gentleman, I shall live to be thankful to thee for it. Master Malvolio? My good fool. 
Command her followers, take and give back affairs, and their dispatch with such a smooth, discreet, and stable bearing as I perceive she does. There's something in it that is deceivable. But here the lady comes. Blame not this haste of mine, if you mean well. Now go with me, and with this holy man, into the chantry by, there, before him. And underneath that consecrated roof, like me the full assurance of thy faith, that my most jealous and too doubtful soul may live at peace. He will conceal it, whilst you are willing it shall come to note, what time we will our celebration keep, according to my birth. What do you say? I will follow this good man, and, and go with you. And having sworn truth, ever will prove true. Then lead the way, good father, and heaven so shine that they may fairly note this act of mine. Now, as thou loves me, <laughs> let me see his letter. <laughs> God's 
mass of Vesve, grant me a mother of Christ. Anything. Who knows desire to see this lasser? <laughs> oh, this is to give a dog an eleven pence desire my dog again. <laughs> Belong you to oh. the Lady Olivia, friend? Oh, I say, we are some of her trappings. <laughs> I know thee well. <laughs> oh, that's so, my good fellow. <laughs> oh, truly, sir, the better for me foes and the worse for me friends. Just the contrary, the better for thy friends. <laughs> no, sir, the worse. How can that be? Oh, marry, sir, they praise me and make an ass of me. <laughs> now, my foes tell me plainly I am an ass. So that by my foes, sir, I profit in the knowledge of myself, whereas by my friends I am abused. Why, this is excellent. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not so, sir, by my troth, though it please you to be one of my friends. <laughs> well, thou shalt not be the worst for me. There's gone. Ooh! <laughs> Ooh. Um, <clears throat> but that it would be double dealing, sir. <laughs> I wish you could make it another. Oh, you give me ill counsel? Oh, put your grace in your pocket for this one, sir, and let your flesh and blood obey it. Well, I will be so much the sinner to be a double dealer. <gasps> There's another. Secundo Tercio is a good play, and the old saying is the third place for all. <laughs> the triplet, sir, is a good tripping measure. <laughs> or perhaps, sir, the powers of St. Benny might put you in mind. One, a two, a three. You can fool no more money out of me at this throw. If you will let your lady know that I am here to speak with her and bring her along with you. It may awake my bounty further. Oh, marry, sir! Let it to your bounty till I come again! <laughs> I go, <don't>, sir! <laughs> oh, but well, I would not have you to think that my desire of having is a sin of covetousness. <laughs> oh, but as you say, sir, <laughs> let your bounty take a nap. I will awake it anon! <laughs> That face of his I do remember well. But when I saw it last, it was besmeared as black as Vulcan in the smoke of war. A bauble vessel was he captain of, of shallow draught and bulk unprizable, with which such scaleful grapple did he make with the most noble bottom of our fleet, that very envy and the tongue of loss cried fame and honour on him. What's the matter? This is that Antonio that took a, the phoenix into her fraught from candy. And this is he that did the tiger board when your young nephew Titus lost his leg here in the streets, desperate from shame and state. In private rabble did we apprehend him. He did me kindness, sir, true on my side, but in conclusion put strange speech upon me. I know not twas but distraction. Notable pirate. Now salt water thief. What foolish boldness brought thee to their mercy, whom thou, in terms so bloody and so dear, hast made thine enemies? Poor oh, Sino, noble sir, be pleased that I shake off those names you give me. Antonio never yet was thief or pirate. That most ingrateful boy there by your side. From the rude seas for me and enraged mouth did I redeem. His life I gave him. A wreck past hope he was. For his graceless sake did I expose myself, pure for his love, into the dangers of this adverse town. Drew and defend him when he was beset, where being apprehended denied me my own purse which I had recommended to his use not half an hour before. How can this be? When came he to this town? Today, my lord, and for three months before, no interim, not a minute's vacancy, both day and night did we keep company. 
Here comes the Countess. Now heaven walks on earth. For thee, fellow, fellow, thy words are madness. Three months this youth hath tended upon me. But more of that anon. Stand you aside. Would my lord, that he may not have, wherein Olivia may seem serviceable. Cesario, you do not keep promise with me. Madam? Gracious Olivia. Good my lord, what do you say? My lord would speak, my duty hushes me. Oh, if it be aught to the old tune, my lord, it is as fat and fulsome to mine ear as howling after music. Still so cruel. Still so constant, lord. What a perverseness! You uncivil lady, to whose ingrate and unauspicious altars my soul the faithfulest offerings hath breathed out, that e'er devotion tendered, what shall I do? Even what it please, my lord, that shall become him. Why should I not? Like to the Egyptian thief on point of death, had I the heart to do it, kill what I love. A savage jealousy that sometimes savours nobly. But since you to non regards cast my faith, and since I partly know the instrument that screws me from my true place in your favour, live you the marble-breasted tyrant still. But this, your minion, whom I know you love, and whom by heaven I swear I tender dearly, him will I tear out from that cruel eye where he sits crowned in his master's spite. Come, boy, with me. My thoughts are right on mischief. I'll sacrifice the land that I do love. The spite of Raymond's heart with an adult. Love, most jocund, apt, and willingly to do you rest a thousand deaths would die with a ghost of Zario. After him, I love more than I love these eyes. More than my life, more by all mores than e'er I shall love wife. If I do fain, you witnesses above, punish my life for fainting of my love. How be detested? How am I beguiled? Who does beguile you? Who does do you wrong? Hast thou forgot thyself? <laughs> Is it so long? Call forth the Holy Father. Come away. Whither, my lord, Cesario, husband, stay. Husband? Aye, husband, can he that deny? A husband, sir? No, my lord, not I. Alas, it is the baseness of thy fear that makes thee strangle thy propriety. Fear not, Cesario, take thy fortunes up. Be what thou knowest thou art, and then thou art as great as that thou fearest. For welcome, father. Father, I charge thee on thy reverence, here to unfold. Oh, what occasion concealed to us before twas ripe, what thou dost know hath newly passed between this youth and me. A contract of eternal bond of love, confirmed by mutual joinder of your hands, strengthened by interchangement of your rings, and all the ceremony of this compact sealed in my function by my testimony. Without a settling cup, what wilt thou be when time hath sowed a grizzle on thy face? Or will not else thy craft so quickly grow that thine own trip shall be thine overthrow? Devil! <laughs> Take her! But direct thy feet henceforth where thou and I may never meet! My lord, I do protest! Do not swear! Old oh, little faith, though thou hast too much fear. For the love of God, a surgeon, so one presently to Sir Toby. Why, what's the matter? Go my head across and give it to Toby a bloody costume, too. Oh, for the love of God, you're not much rather than 40 pound over at home. Oh, I have done this, Sir Andrew. Oh. The Count's gentleman wants his iron. We took him for a coward, but he's the very devil in Cardinal. My gentleman, Cesario. Oh, sir, please! <laughs> well, there he is! Oh, you broke my head for nothing! And that that I did to you, I was settled to do it by Sir Toby! Why do you speak to me? I never heard you. You drew your sword upon me without cause, but I bespake you fair and hurt you not. And the bloody coxcomb you have hurt you have hurt me! I think you said nothing in a bloody coxcomb. 
Here comes the Toby, haunting. Uh, oh, you shall hear more anon. Uh, if you had not been in tricky, I'd have tickled you other games than he did. Uh, oh, now, cousin, how is with you? <laughs> That's all one. Is help me in there's a nangdom. Sergeant! Did say did Sergeant Sergeant? He's drunk, Sir Toby. An hour ago, his eyes are set at eight in the morning. Then it's a rogue! And a passing measure's bumming! I hate a drunken rogue. Away with him! Who have made this havoc with them? I'll help you, Sir Toby, for we'll be dressed together. Will you help? An asset! And a coxcomb! And a knave! A thin faced knave! A gull! Get him to bed and let his heart be up to. I am sorry, madam. I've hurt your kinsman. But had it been the brother of my blood, I must have done no less with wit and safety. You. You throw a strange regard upon me, and by that I do perceive it has offended you. But pardon me, sweet one, even for those vows we made each other but so late ago. One face, one voice, one habit, and two persons. A natural perspective that is and is not. Antonio! Oh, my dear Antonio! Huh? How oh, have the hours racked and tortured me since I have seen thee? Sebastian, are you? Who fears thou that, Antonio? How have you made a vision of yourself? Now, <laughs> <laughs> Clifton, two is not all twin than these two creatures. Which is Sebastian? Most wonderful! Do I stand there? I never had a brother. <laughs> Nor can there be that deity in my nature of here and everywhere. I had a sister whom, whom the blind waves and surges that devoured. Of charity, what kin are you to me? What, what countryman? What name? What, what, what parentage? Of Messaline. Sebastian was my father. Such as Sebastian was my brother, too. So went he suited to his watery tomb. If spirits can assume my form, then suit you come to fright us. Spirit I am indeed. But I'm in that dimension grossly clad, which from the womb I did participate. Were you a woman, as the rest goes even, I would my tears let fall upon your cheek and cry thrice welcome, drown in fire love. My father had a mole upon his brow. And so had mine. And died that day when Viola from my birth had done with thirteen years. That record is lively in my soul. He finished it indeed his mortal act the day that made my sister thirteen years. If nothing lets to make us happy both, with this my masculine is up to time. Do not embrace me till each circumstance of place. Time, fortune, do go here and jump that I am Viola. The works you can thumb. I'll bring you to a captain in this town where lie my maiden wees. By whose gentle help I was preserved to serve this noble count. All the occasion of my fortune since has been between this lady and this lord. <laughs> so comes it, lady, you have been restored. <sighs> but nature to her bias grew in that. You would have been contracted to a maid. <laughs> No, nor are you there, and by my life deceived, you are betrothed both to a maid and man. <laughs> be not amazed. Right noble is his blood. If this be so, as yet the glass seems true, I shall have share in this most happy wreck. Boy! <laughs> thou hast said to me a thousand times thou never shouldst love woman like to me. And all those sayings will I overswear. And all those swearings hold as true in soul as doth the orbit continent the fire that severs day from night. Give me thy hand, and let me see thee in thy woman's weeds. <laughs> the captain that did bring me first on shore hath my maid's garments. 
He, upon some action, is now in durance at Malvolio's suit, a gentleman and follower of my lady's. He shall enlarge him. Fetch Malvolio hither. And yet, alas, now I do remember. They say, poor gentleman, he's much distract. The most extracting frenzy of mine own, from my remembrance, clearly banished his. How does he, Cyril? True matter. He holds the Elsie Bub at the stage's end as well as a man in his case may do. Is here at you a letter. Open it and read it. Be then well edified when the fool delivers the madman. <clears throat> By the Lord, by the Lord! Oh, now art thou mad? No, madam. I do but read madness. And your ladyship will have it as it ought to be. You must allow Vox. Oh, pretty read in thy right wits. So I do, Madonna. But to read in his right wits is to read thus. Therefore, perpend, fair princess, and give ear. Read it, you, Sirrah. By the Lord, madam, you wrong me, and the world shall know it. Though you have put me into darkness and given your drunken cousin rule over me, yet have I the benefit of my senses as well as your ladyship. I have your own letter that induced me to the semblance I put on, with the which I doubt not but to do myself much right or you much shame. Think of me as you please. I leave my duty a little unthought of and speak out of my injury. The madly used Alonio. Did he write this? Why, madam? This savours not much of distraction. See him delivered, Feste. Bring him hither. My lord. These things further thought on. Do you think me as well, a sister, as a wife? One day shall crown the alliance on it, so please you. Here at my house, and at my proper cost. Madam, I am most apt to embrace your offer. Your master quits you, and for your service, dumb him. So much against the metal of your sex, so far beneath your soft and tender breathing. And since you called me master for so long, here is my hand. You shall from this time be your master's mistress. Oh, her sister, you were she. Mistress mine, where are you roaming? For oh, stay and hear your true love's calling that can sing both high and low. Trivial, feather, pretty, sweeting, Jenny's ending lovers. Every wise and son doth know. Is this the man? Oh, the same, my lord. How do you, Malvolio? Madam, you have done me wrong. A notorious wrong! Have I, Malvolio? No. Lady, you have. Pray you peruse that letter. You must not now deny it is your hand. Why, you have given me such clear lights of favour. Bade me come, smiling and cross guarded to you, to put on yellow stockings and to frown upon Sir Toby and the lighter people. Acting this in, a, in an obedient hope. Why, you have suffered me to be imprisoned, kept in a dark house, and visited by the priest. And made the most notorious get and go that e'er invention played on. Tell me why. Alas, Malvolio, this is not my writing, though I confess much like the character. But out of question, tis Maria's hand. And now I do bethink me, twas she first told me thou wast mad. Then came in smiling, and in such forms which here were presupposed upon thee in the letter. Prithee be content. This practice hath most shrewdly passed upon me. But when we know the grounds and authors of it, 
Thou shalt be both the judge and the plaintiff of thine own cause. Good madam, hear me speak. Oh, let no quarrel, nor no brawl to come take the condition of this present hour. Most freely I admit myself and Toby set this device upon Malvario here. Upon some stubborn and uncourteous parts we had conceived of. Maria written the letter at Sir Toby's great importance, in recompense of which she hath married her. <gasps> How his scornful malice this was followed may rather plug on laughter than revenge, if that one the injuries are just way that have on both sides passed. Alas, poor fool, how have they baffled thee? Why? Some are born great, <laughs> some achieve greatness, and some have greatness to the rest upon them. I was one, sir, in this interlude, one Sir Topaz, sir. But that's all one. By the Lord, fool, I am not that. But do you remember? Madam, why laugh you so at such a barren rascal? And you smile not, he's gagged. And thus the whirligig of time brings in his revenges. Sweet sister, we will not part from hence. Come, Cesario, for so you shall be while you are a man. But when in other garments you are seen, Orsino's mistress and his fancy's queen. <laughs> when that I was a little tiny boy, with hey ho, the wind and the rain, a foolish thing was but a toy. For the rain it raineth every day. But when I came to man's estate with hey ho, the wind and the rain, against knaves and thieves, men shut their gate. For the rain it raineth every day. But when I came, alas, to wife with hey. Hey! 